welcome again then. Uh, I'm Rick there. I'm the pastor here at the River Church. And today we are continuing in our 12 Dead Men Speak series in which we are working through the 12 minor uh, prophets of the Old Testament. And minor just means shorter. I don't know about you. I, I love those moments when in worship, God is speaking to us. As we glorify him, as we focus on what he's done and who he is, and then it ministers to our hearts. And I particularly love it when I'm preaching and I'm like, great, this is all that we're going to be doing today. God is already speaking. And that's maybe somewhat of a surprise because as we approach Nahum, possibly one of the most difficult bits of the Bible, Brian's already nodding, how amazing that God is already drawing out some of the themes that he, uh, that we're going to hear in this book. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to try and highlight them, but but just just have them on your heart and and let Nahum uh, speak to you. And I mentioned not many of us know Nahum very well. It's quite short. It's easy to skip over, um, and it's probably understandable that we don't know it because while it's a almost a direct sequel to Jonah that Katie preached a couple of weeks ago so excellently, it. It's not a Sunday school favorite, if I put it like that. In, uh, Jonah's full of hope and funny stories. and th This is not that. This is quite a hard book, actually. And why? Well, because in the story of Jonah, after some fluctuation, we could say, Jonah finally went to the city of Nineveh, uh, which was in the Assyrian uh, Empire, the capital of it. And he, and he said to Nineveh, unless you repent of your evil ways, destruction is going to come to you. And the good news is they repented. Hallelujah. But the d repentance didn't last long. Within about a generation of Jonah's message, the Assyrian leaders had turned away from God and turned back to their invading, murdering, and enslaving ways. Within probably another 20 years, another generation or so, they had conquered and emptied of its population the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of the people of God. So we heard uh, last week in Micah. And it's against this evil that God speaks through his prophet Nahum. And in Nahum, we see a prophet predicting and celebrating the destruction of the city of Nineveh and the evil Assyrian empire along with it. It's three chapters long, and it's basically three chapters of vengeance. And that's really hard. But you know what? This is why we preach in the way we do at the River Church. Where we, we pick a book and we work through it, warts and all, or, you know, in this a series of books. Because we don't want to skip over the hard stuff in the Bible, because the Bible doesn't skip over the hard stuff of our life. There is hard stuff. And we need to face it. And we need to ask the tough questions. And so that's what we're going to do today. If you have a Bible, um, do open it. Nahum chapter 1. I'm mostly going to be in chapter 1 today. But I will be making reference to the other two chapters as well. Um, and uh, I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, as ever, if you have a Bible, good to have it open in front of you. Because I will be making lots of references to it. But just listen along if not. An oracle concerning Nineveh. A prophecy about Nineveh. It's very clear. This is about you, Nineveh. No one else except it becomes a bit more global later. The book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Rough start. The, lo the Lord is slow to anger, oh good, and great in power, and the lo Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, the bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Whoa. Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against the Lord? 
He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. Can I just, David, can you just stand here a second? And Eleanor, can you just stand here? This bit's like slightly complicated. Who's he aiming at? So this is Nineveh. Boo. This is the people of God. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so just watch me as I do this. They are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink, and they are consumed like stubble fully dried. From you, says God to him, from you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, and I'll say it to you, though they, is this helpful? Yeah. Though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more, and I will break his yoke from off you and burst your bonds apart. Okay? Sorry, I know that bit's tricky. There we go. That was the best way I could think to do that. Sit down, give him a clap. That's about as fun as it's going to get. <laughs> Nahum is a hard book. There's no two ways about it. It offends every sensibility of our culture. Our culture kind of ignoring <laughs> the Christian history that teaches everything it knows assumes that every human life is precious. That's right, okay? But we only know that because the Bible tells us that they're all made in the image of God. But if that is true, how is it then that the prophet Nahum invites us to celebrate with him at the destruction of so many human lives? How can that be? Well, it's because as offended as we should be at the loss of human life, and we should, and no one feels that more keenly than God, they are his creation, as offended as we should be at the loss of human life, we should also be offended if justice were not done. If instead of interceding for the sake of righteousness and justice, God merely stood back and laughed at the state of man. That is an abhorrent thought. And it's not true. And we know, don't we, that in the person of Jesus Christ, God is far from being a God who stands at a distance, but is instead one who steps right in to our mess, our pain and our humanity. But even here in Nahum, 600 years before Jesus was even born, God is revealed as not a disinterested deity, but an avenger. An avenger. And you, you think, well, I, I didn't really hear that word that w Rick was reading. I heard vengeance. Well, that's partly because uh, verse 2 particularly um, in the Hebrew is in a slightly different order, but they've changed around to make sense in English language. So I'm going to reorder it back into the, not in Hebrew, still in English, but you know. But uh, listen to this. This is kind of what it should say in verse 2. A jealous God and an avenger is the Lord. An avenger is the Lord and owner of wrath. An avenger is the Lord against his enemies. God is revealed in Nahum as an avenger. What does that mean? What is an avenger? For many of us, uh, it's synonymous with uh, people like Captain America, Thor, Hulk, and a seemingly never-ending roster of Marvel superheroes particularly when you get into the mess of the multiverse. But actually, that's not as far off as we might think. Yeah? Because they're the, the defenders, the protectors, the, the heroes of Earth, aren't they? Earth's mightiest heroes. It's kind of what God is. There's a moment in the first Avengers film where it's not going very well. You know, they're not gelling. They're not, you know, the team doesn't look like it's going to happen. And then something happens. A friend dies. Spoilers, I know, but it's been 11 years. You can get over it. A guy dies. And what does he say as he goes? He's like, it's good. Ah. Alas, they have something to avenge. Ah, plot writing. Ah. But that's what's going on. They need something to strike back against. They need something to become avengers. They need to become the defenders of the people who are being struck. And that's what's happening in these passages. God is the avenger of his people. They've been struck down and he strikes back. Out of Nineveh came one who plotted evil against the Lord. Actually, even in that, God is being pretty kind. Many, many ones came out of Nineveh to assault the people of God. But he's just saying, look, look, one of them, they came and attacked you. And they will be cut down and pass away, verse 12 says. 
God is avenging his people. And that's tough, but it is good news. Verse 3, the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. He's slow to anger. That's the first bit of that passage. But he will not clear the guilty. Similarly, verse 8, he's a stronghold. He's a rest, refuge. But with an overflowing flood, he will end his adversaries. He's good and he won't stand for evil. Though he waits, hallelujah, he cannot and will not let evil go unpunished. And this is good news. Why? Because we live in a broken, fallen world where children are abused, where women are assaulted, where the innocent are downtrodden and the wealthy and powerful scorn. I encounter these things on the news in my life and sadly in my church. And when that happens, I long for vengeance. I cry out to my avenger, make it right, God. And you know what? God doesn't turn a blind eye. That's what Nahum tells us. God isn't ignorant of these things, which is good news and perhaps a comfort to those of us who uh, maybe used to live in Nottingham and this week have heard the terrible news of murder and assault on the streets that we know so well. I got married just there. I used to go to the gym just there. God, make it right. And he doesn't turn a blind eye. But you don't even have to travel for that to be the case. I mean, listen to the lyrics of someone like Sam Fender in his song, Two People, which is about domestic violence. Two people under bedsheets. One does whatever he pleases. Horrible. One tries to speak to Jesus, but Jesus won't hear a sound. A heartbreaking lyric. Terrifying statement. And hallelujah, entirely untrue because Jesus hears, and he will avenge every evil. He is good. <laughs> Verse 7, hallelujah, that light in the darkness. He is good. He's good. He's so good, that's the way, the, where the word God comes from. There you go, in English, you just take out the O. Ah, oh, the God is good. But you know what? It's sometimes easy to mistake good for permissive you know he lets us do what we want you know oh, that uh, that god that jesus he's a nice guy he's a nice guy he doesn't really mind what you do with your life he'll forgive you at the end you know don't listen to that old testament god he's kind of grumpy we don't like him so much that's not true the, the god of the old testament is the god of the new testament jesus is the revelation of the father and the spirit he's with us The Lord is good, but he will pursue his enemies into darkness. Those are hard things to hold together, aren't they? Those are hard truths that are both true. But it is good news. The commentator Elizabeth Actemeyer, she says this, it's almost incomprehensible, she says, that our age has so softened these thoughts of God's destruction of evil because if God doesn't destroy the evil that human beings have brought into God's good creation, the world can never return to the wholeness he intended it from the beginning. It cuts right across our culture. That really gets into our blood. We don't like that. Why? Because we're a people of progress. Yeah? We talk about that. Progressive is a very popular word, isn't it? We want progress. We assume the world is somehow progressing all on its own to some utopian state. Again, actually, that, that sense of progress only comes from the history of Christianity in the West. Because God promises that at the end, it will all be made right. That he will turn all evil to good. Yeah. But it cuts across the grain of our culture because we don't think there should be evil that needs destroying to attain that good. Because humanity is always just getting better on its own, isn't it? The news doesn't tell me that. Is it scary? Is it scary, this, this picture of God? It kind of should be. I think it should be. You, you read verse 6, and I think it's pretty scary. Who can stand before his indignation? Do you want to do that? Do you want to stand before God? Who can endure the heat of his anger? 
I think this is scary. And that's okay because the worst thing we can do is to domesticate God, you know, to somehow tame him into some sort of palatable butler that affirms everything you do. Yeah, that's fine. I don't really like it, but you carry on. That's fine. That's not who he is. He's good. He's unassailably good. And it would be easy to jump straight to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And we're going to get there. We jump to Jesus, who takes the vengeance, takes the destru- destruction, takes the wrath of God onto himself in an act of love f- for us. Yes, he does do that. Good. Hold that. Because actually, I don't want us to miss the message of love that Nahum is. Nahum itself is a message of love. You don't have to jump to Jesus. Okay? Because he's good. And vengeance, destruction, and wrath are not evidence of the absence of love. In fact, they are the proof of love. Thomas Constable puts it like this. Nahum teaches the reader that to believe in God's love is to be sure of his love, his wrath. To believe in his love is to be sure of his wrath. If God is never angry, he doesn't love. His anger grows out of his love. Can you look at sin, pride, oppression, and cruelty and not be moved? Then you don't love. Do you not care that women are being abused and children neglected by fathers who are so selfish that they think only of their own pleasures? Then you are incapable of love. If God cannot burn with hatred, he is a God incapable of love. To believe in his love is to be sure of his wrath. Shocking as it seems, Nahum's three chapters of vengeance are born out of God's passionate love for his people because the Assyrians of Nineveh had violently abused the people of God. Violently. Read the book. Assyria had lied, plundered, torn nations apart. And we only know about Israel and Judah, you know, Israel destroyed entirely, uh, Judah besieged, God's power mocked in the process. Check out last week's uh, Micah podcast for more. But that was true all over the ancient Near East. Such that in the last chapter, the last verse of Nahum, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, it says, All who hear the news about you and your demise, clap their hands. This was an evil, evil people who'd assaulted the people of God and their neighbors and their avenger says, no more. Evil will not go unpunished. And that is good news because it's born out of love. I want to be really, really clear at this point. Vengeance belongs to God alone. Okay? Okay. We Christians are not called to vengeance, to avenge, to get strike back. What does Jesus say? You get struck on the face, you turn the other cheek. We're not called to vengeance, but forgiveness. God will deal with evil. Hallelujah. You do not. Amen? Let's not forget that it was actually for their own punishment that God allowed Judah to be afflicted by Assyria. I afflicted you, God says. I know they did it, but it was me who was in the background. Okay, I know there's a whole sermon there on like God's in charge and we have free will. Those things are both true as well, but we've got enough to cover today. Okay, so just come and chat to me about that another time. We River Church, we're not in the business of vengeance. Okay, we are in the business of forgiveness, safe in the knowledge that justice will be done to our persecutors. And I can say all this to you, but do you know what? If we're honest with ourselves, our issue is not so much that we're offended by vengeance. We're not okay with it. Our issue is actually that we're impatient for injustice. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said, we want the Lord to take vengeance right now. How many people have heard a wrong, seen a wrong, experienced a wrong in their lives, and they want God to be vengeful right now? I'm not going to ask. Hallelujah, ladies and gentlemen, hallelujah. Verse one, uh, verse 3 of chapter 1 says, He is slow 
to anger. He is patient. Think back to your own testimony. That proves that to be true. When you came to faith, did God immediately reveal all the sins and shame that are in your life and you need to deal with them right there and then? No, thank God. He is slow to anger and he patiently, gently says to sons and daughters, welcome home. Let me just deal with some of these issues in your life. Bit by little bit. There's way more than you realize. But I've got time because I love you. I'm committed to you. He's slow and that is good news. Think about the fall. Adam and Eve, the first sin, right? When they eat the forbidden fruit, does God come down on them like a ton of bricks straight away? I knew you'd do it. No. He says he went for a nice breezy walk in the garden. Is this because God is not all-knowing? And he only found out about Adam and Eve when he tripped over the banana skin or whatever it was, what kind of fruit it was? No. It's because he's slow. Hallelujah. Slow to sentence them. He's slow, too, to fulfill their punishment. Chapter 2 of uh, Genesis says, In the day that you eat of the fruit, the banana of good and evil. I don't know what it was. It just wasn't an apple, okay? And we all had that in our head. <laughs> On the day you eat that, you will surely die. Do they? No. He sends them out. He clothes them. They have a children. They, f- they fulfill the promises of God. Why? Because God contradicts himself? No, it's because he's slow to anger. Hallelujah. But evil will not go unavenged. Look at the Ninevites. God gave them time. Less than 100 years before, they had repented at Jonah's message and now turned away from God. Similarly, there's loads of allusions in the text. Maybe you heard some of them as I read it to to the flood of of, uh, Noah, to the Red Sea with Moses. You know those stories, perhaps. Don't worry, zone out for the next minute if you don't. But the reason they're there is because they're, they're images of God's destruction of evil, yeah? But they also remind the hearer of God's slowness. The people who heard this, they would have known Genesis better than you and I do. And in Genesis chapter 10, one of the grandsons of Noah, Noah comes out of the boat, has lots of families, and one of his grandsons is called Egypt. Egypt, who is actually name-checked along with his uh, brother Cush in chapter 3 of Nahum. Both the Egyptians who persecuted the Israelites to the Red Sea and the Ninevites who dragged Israel across the Euphrates are children, grandchildren of salvation. And they've turned their backs on God. But God is slow to anger. Jonah was offended at God's slowness too, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone I spoke to about Katie's message, Katie was brilliant. I didn't know there was a chapter four of Jonah. Because he's grumpy about it. He's not offended that, you know, he's, he's not offended at vengeance. No, he, he wanted vengeance. You know, these people have blighted my people. Come strike back, God. No, he was offended at God's mercy. He was offended at God's forgiveness. You know, as humans, we're actually really easily offended at both of those things. God, how dare you? How dare you forgive that person? Do you not know what they've done? How dare you punish that person? Don't you know what they're like? We're so easily offended at both. Anyone recognize this in their own life? I know I do. Pride. (laughs) What pride, what arrogance. I think we're better off humbling ourselves. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. A stronghold in a day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. The Lord is good. And Romans tells us all have fallen short of that impossibly high standard. And so every one of us stands in judgment. Friends, there is a real hell. 
There is real evil. There is real punishment. There is heat. There is fire, as verse 6 says. We don't know the specifics. We don't need to get too clever on that. Nahum just gives us an emotional picture, but Jesus did not shy away from the truth of hell, and neither should we. All have fallen short of the goodness, the absolute goodness of God, and all deserve the heat and fire of his indignation, therefore. And yet, hallelujah, just as in the story of Noah, there is salvation for the faithful. Just as in the story of the Red Sea, the Lord has made a way from death to life for his people. There is a stronghold, there is a refuge, and it is, hallelujah, Christ on the cross alone. Verse 6 asks, who, who, oh, who, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the wrath? Sorry, the heat of his anger, making up the Bible. Who is it? Jesus. I love that song we sung right at the beginning. How deep the father's love away. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a funny line in it that lots of people get really angry about. Oh, we should take it out of our songbooks. I don't care. It's a good song. The father turns his face away. He didn't. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 13, and I'm riffing now, so forgive me if I go back on myself in a minute. But chapter 2, verse 13 says this. Behold, I am against you. At that point, God is speaking to Nineveh, but also we know ultimately Satan and our sin. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Behold, I am against you. On the cross, Jesus took the wrath of God that was poured out like fire. And the father looked at him and said, behold, I am against you. The father looked at the son and said, you have become sin." Because all of us deserve to die. All of us need the wrath of Nahum that is preached here, except one, except one who was without sin and yet became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The father looks at the son and says, behold, I am against you. And so when we put our faith in him, the man on the cross to whom the father says, you have become sin, do you know what he says to us? Romans 8. Some of you know this. <laughs> no longer I am against you. I am for you. I am for you. God is for you. The same God who in Nahum, we cannot stand before him. We cannot stand the heat of his anger. This one, he now fights for us. He is now our avenger. Because he looked at Jesus and said, I am against you. And so he looks at us and says, I am for you. Isn't that good news? Isn't that incredible? And am I ever going to be able to find my place again? We cry for vengeance. We cry for justice. But every time we do, Every time we point our finger, we see three pointing back and know that we're not good. Not good as God is good. We too are children of salvation. We've turned our backs on God time and time again. But in Christ, the one whom God says, I'm against. He says, I am for you now. Do you know, for all who love justice. I know many of you in the room do. The cross is an offense. It's an offense. Because the guiltless one is condemned. And the guilty ones go free. Kind of have a bit of sympathy with Jonah. How dare you forgive these people? The cross is the place where justice is done and mercy is poured out. The cross is an outrage. <laughs> It means that sinners like you and me, like abusers, like the ones that Sam Fender sings about, if they put their faith in Jesus, will be forgiven by him. We will be. They will be. Everyone will be when we put our faith in him. And he says, the damage done to my own flesh counts as your punishment for evil. Maybe you know the story of the thief on the cross next to Jesus, who in his very last moments was saved out of the jaws of hell by putting his faith in Jesus. Hallelujah, that means it's never too late, hallelujah, for us to give our lives to Jesus. But you know, why wait? 
If you've never done that, why not do so today? Ask a blunt question. If you were to die today, do you know where you'd be going? Do you know what the Father would say to you? I'm against you, I am for you. I said earlier that, and forgive me, I'm kind of making this up now because I got in a bit of a muddle. Yes, the Father says, I'm against you to Jesus on the cross. Yes, he rose, hallelujah, and is now back with the Father. <laughs> Does not miss that step. But also uh, Nineveh here is a picture of Satan, is a picture of the enemy. Because as real as hell is, Satan is real. Demons are real. Yeah. And they're both imaged in the prophecies of Nahum to Nehemiah. Uh, Nineveh, sorry. Yes, at the cross, Satan was defeated. His power was bound. But today he still has influence on the world. But Nahum, hallelujah, prophesies complete victory. Let's look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter 1. The Lord has given commandment about you, enemy. No more shall your name be perpetuated. I will make your grave, for you are vile. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows. But never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Satan is vile. He's fallen and he's condemned and he longs to drag as many into hell as he can. So today he persecutes the church. But there will come a day when he is utterly cut off. His voice is no longer heard. His name will not be perpetuated and the Lord will hold a feast for his bride, his people. The Lord is slow to anger, but he will by no means clear the guilty. For with an overflowing flood, just like Noah, just like the Red Sea, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. We will have victory. At the cross, vengeance belongs to the Lord and victory belongs to you. If you put your, faith, put your faith in Jesus. He will stamp out every evil from your life. In his death and resurrection, he defeated death and put to shame every evil power and he will avenge every wrong that's ever been done to you. But that's in the future. What about today? Well, today we stand not accused, not in fear, but in blessing. This is my final thing. Verse 10 of chapter 1. I wonder if you noticed as we read. It says, they will be like drunkards as they drink. This is not a comment on their sobriety, but rather a reference that runs throughout the Old Testament to the cup of God's judgment. I'm just going to quickly turn to Psalm 75, verse 8. In the hand of the Lord, there is a cup with foaming wine. I know sometimes Bible images sort of escape us because we don't live in the same world. I don't think I ever want to see wo wine that's foaming. Well mixed. And he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. This is the cup of judgment. This is the cup of curse. This is the cup of staggering, and it is the cup that Jesus drank. The cup that Jesus said, Lord, let it pass from me, but drank it to the dregs, so that we might receive instead the cup of blessing. Nahum isn't a message that immediately actively says, this is how you apply it. Okay? What do you do with Nahum? I've been asking myself as I've been preparing this. Tell you what you don't do, you don't seek vengeance. Okay, good. God will do that. But what we do do is we repent. Whether for the first time or the hundredth time. And we rejoice in our salvation. We come to the table of Christ and drink the cup of blessing that he gives you in exchange for the cup of curse that we gave him. The gospel is outrageous. It's offensive even. That though God will take vengeance on evil, he's slow to anger. He is the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, 100 chances. And he does not wish you to perish, but have eternal life. 
And so to you, you, this morning, he offers you a place at his table. And he says this, just close your eyes. Drink the cup of blessing, for I have drunk the cup of curse. Feed on my broken body, unto which I have taken the wrath of God. Rejoice that because I stood before his indignation and endured the heat of his anger, you stand as welcomed sons and daughters of the good God, your avenger and saviour. Amen.